What stories do you tell about yourself? What stories have you heard from family about your ancestors? What did your parents tell you about your community, your city, your country? An early genealogy of my family, written by a family member, prints a family crest in the book. Now, my dad has been working on this genealogy, updating it, adding references, doing some research, and the long story short is that we never had a crest. It was totally made up, but why? Probably to make my English ancestors seem more important than they actually were. My ancestors were probably farmers or some kind of peasantry tied to the land. There was no crest. There's no record of any notable exploits or heroic deeds in war. We were just regular people. But when my ancestors came over to the New World, they were one of the first families to settle here. So things changed a little bit. There was work to do, not a lot of people to do it, and my family status got elevated. The genealogist in question, writing a few generations after these events, probably wanted to make it seem like our family has always been that way. But the truth is, we weren't. All stories have a motivation. And what happens when you're writing a story about a time period for which there is almost no physical, tangible, material evidence, and certainly no contemporary writing? Today, we're looking at stories about a time period for which there is no physical evidence. Rome's early mytho-history, the time period when kings were in charge in central Italy, is known to us only through accounts that were written centuries after the events. Today, we're investigating those stories and what they say about the Roman sense of self and how we ourselves see them. My name is Kate, and welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. Let's get the elephant out of the room here. When I say the word myth, I'm not talking about it in the modern sense, something that is absolutely false and is known to be false, but that some people still believe. I'm talking about mythology, stories about ancient times, divine and supernatural beings, heroes, and magnificent exploits. These stories are told to prove a point. They're meant to tell about certain values, ideas, concepts, and to teach them to children to pass on throughout the generations. So when I'm talking about Rome's foundation myths, I usually refer to the period as Rome's early mytho-history. And this is because, again, there is not much in the way of archaeology for this early period. All we have are the written testimonies from centuries after the fact that may have an element of truth to them, but we can't really prove it one way or the other. But before we go any further with Rome, let's talk for a minute conceptually about foundation myths. Here in the United States, we do have foundation myths. The difference between our circumstance and Rome's circumstance is that we have a ton of evidence from the time period when these things were happening. We know a lot about the beginning of our country, the documents produced, we still have the original copies. We know who these people were, what they believed, we have a lot of their writings. And so it's easy for us to figure out exactly what happened. And yet, we still tell stories. Like the story about my family crest. We even pass down legends about people whose writing we have. Not only is it published, but it's even freely available on the internet. Take George Washington. Many of you will know the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. It's one of the earliest foundation myths for the United States. But even though George Washington died in 1799, 
This story didn't appear until 1806 in a biography by Mason Locke Weems. When George was about six years old, he was made the wealthy master of a hatchet, of which, like most little boys, he was immoderately fond, and was constantly going about chopping everything that came in his way. One day, in the garden, where he often amused himself hacking his mother's pea sticks, he unluckily tried the edge of his hatchet on the body of a beautiful young English cherry tree which he barked so terribly that I don't believe the tree ever got the better of it. The next morning, the old gentleman finding out what had befallen his tree, which, by the by, was a great favorite, came into the house and with much warmth asked for the mischievous author, declaring at the same time that he would not have taken five guineas for his tree. Nobody could tell him anything about it. Presently, George and his hatchet made their appearance. George, said his father, do you know who killed that beautiful little cherry tree yonder in the garden? This was a tough question, and George staggered under it for a moment, but quickly recovered himself, and looking at his father with the sweet face of youth, brightened with the inexpressible charm of all conquering truth, he bravely cried out, I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. Run to my arms, you dearest boy, cried his father in transports. Run to my arms, glad am I, George, that you ever killed my tree. For you have paid me for it a thousandfold. Such an act of heroism in my son is more worth than a thousand trees, though blossomed with silver and their fruits of purest gold. It was in this way, by interesting at once both his heart and head, that Mr. Washington conducted George with great ease and pleasure along the happy paths of virtue. Now, it's impossible to verify whether or not this story actually happened. What we can say is that it demonstrates some of the values that people attributed to Washington's character especially something like honesty. Truth, honesty, transparency in government, these are some of the things that are the hallmarks of what this country is supposed to be. We don't have a government that operates entirely outside of the public eye. We're supposed to know what's going on. And people are supposed to tell the truth, even at risk of personal consequences. George didn't know how his father was going to react to finding out that his favorite tree had been cut down by his good-for-nothing little kid. But he told the truth anyway. And that's sort of the point of the story. Now let's take a more recent retelling of the United States' early history. Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical Hamilton, which was first performed in 2015. Lin-Manuel Miranda is much further removed in time from the events that he's writing about than in the last example. And you can see in the lyrics of the songs, in the way that the play is constructed, the values that Lin-Manuel Miranda has and wants to sort of emphasize in this production. Characters talk about women's rights, speak out in favor of immigration, especially immigration from the Caribbean. The character Lawrence in particular is emphasized as an abolitionist. You even get things that are more personal to Lin-Manuel Miranda, like a couple of throwaway lines that reference the rivalry between New York and New Jersey. Now, the production is fairly historically accurate, and there are elements of truth even within the political statements. It is true that there were abolitionist movements at the time. But the values that are put forth and the sentiments expressed by the characters are more a reflection of our time than they are of the time period that is being talked about. The story would not have been written this way in the 1950s or the 1850s. The story is naturally a product both of the original source material and also the writer and the contemporary world where the writer is living. And that's true about mythology in general. 
it says as much about the author as it does the characters involved. But foundation myths are special because they set the tone for your entire society. These stories tell us who we are, who we think we are, and who we aspire to be. Almost all of the sources for the stories that I'm going to discuss in this video come from the Augustan period. They're certainly the earliest versions of a lot of these stories. So I want to just briefly recap what's been going on with Augustus so that we can kind of contextualize these pieces of writing. Augustus, formerly known as Octavian, has just defeated all of his enemies in the last of the civil wars of this period. Now, all Romans at this time were very familiar with civil war. There had already been two major civil wars that spanned a couple of generations by the time Augustus comes to prominence. His adopted father, Julius Caesar, was recently assassinated after he won his civil war against his rival, Pompey Magnus. Julius Caesar's uncle, Marius, had fought his own war earlier than that against the Roman general Sulla. By the time Augustus comes around, we're in the third round of these civil wars, and there are Romans who didn't know anything else since they were born into this situation. Augustus was a pretty savvy guy, and he understood that the only way to put an end to civil wars is to eradicate all of his enemies. And he does. He kills everybody. But... The result was an end to the Civil War and an entry into the period that we know as the Pax Romana or the Pax Augusta, the Peace of Rome or the Augustan Peace. And as we know, a requirement of this new peace was for Augustus to reform the government. He understood that the Republican system was no longer working and he had to navigate this tricky balance of a cultural aversion to kings, more on that in a minute, while also acting as a quasi-monarch. So how was he going to accomplish this? Augustus sets out on a robust propaganda and PR campaign that included everything from architecture, to sculptures, coins, and what we're talking about today, literature. This PR blitz was part of a larger revival in the arts, mostly pro-Augustan arts, and this period is sometimes called the golden age of Latin literature because there's just so much and it is of such high quality. Let's look at some of the foundation myths that were written during this period to try and understand what's happening culturally and to see how Augustus wanted to portray himself, his administration, and the Roman state in general. Let's talk about Aeneas, Rome's earliest founder to reach Italian soil. His story is told in Virgil's Aeneid, which is a 12 book or a 12 chapter epic poem written in Latin in the style of Homer. This poem is required reading for anyone who is interested in ancient Rome. You must read the Aeneid. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. This is just how it is. So I can highly recommend this version. This is Stanley Lombardo's translation. I'll put a link to it down below. This is a really good take on Virgil. It's written in accessible, modern English, easy to understand, but as someone who also has read most of this in Latin, it really preserves the character and the soul of the story. So you're not really missing as much in translation when you read this version. So I would recommend this. I will link this in the description. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to be focusing on the events of book one and book two, especially book two, which happens to be my favorite piece of Latin literature. It makes me cry every time I read it, so we're going to see how we do here. Now, I can't read you books one and two of the Aeneid. We would be here all day, but I'll just briefly summarize and kind of contextualize what's going on, and then we can talk about some of the thematic points that have to do with today's topic. Aeneas is a Trojan, believe it or not. 
He's a prince and he's the cousin of Hector, who is the hero killed by Achilles towards the end of the Iliad. So he's related to the royal family, although he's not directly in line to rule, and he doesn't really play a part in Homer's writing at all. I think he's mentioned maybe once or twice in passing, but that's kind of it. Virgil, on the other hand, writes his entire poem about Aeneas's journey from Troy after Troy has fallen, how he goes all around the Mediterranean, eventually coming to Italy, and what happens when he gets there. We meet Aeneas in Book 1, where he has just crash-landed on the shore. He doesn't know where he is, but we find out later that he is in Carthage, which is a new city that this queen Dido is establishing. Aeneas and Dido hit it off really quickly, and Dido asks Aeneas to describe where he's been and how he arrived on her land. Books two and three consist of Aeneas's story that he tells to Dido. In book two, Aeneas tells Dido about the last days of Troy, right before it falls. He describes the trick of the Trojan horse, the losses that he witnessed, he talks about how King Priam was killed, and how eventually he, his father, his son, and a group of refugees ended up escaping the ruins of Troy. Again, this is just such a beautiful piece of writing, and I cannot recommend enough times for you to read it. It's really, really, really powerful and moving. So let's discuss some of the thematic elements of this story. The first thing I want to point out is that Aeneas's mother is supposedly Venus, Greek Aphrodite, the goddess of love. If Aeneas is Rome's earliest ancestor, that means that Rome is, in a way, the child of Venus. That's pretty cool, but it goes further than that, because Aeneas had a son named Ascanius, and he had an alternate name, Eulus. The Iulii family, the family of Julius Caesar, Iulius Caesar, trace their lineage back to this son of Aeneas named Iulus or Ascanius. And if that's the case, that means that the family of the Julii, the Iulii, trace their ancestry back to the goddess Venus. That's pretty cool for the Julii, but what does that have to do with Augustus? Well, Augustus was adopted posthumously by Julius Caesar, and that means that Augustus gets to claim that he too is descended from Venus. Now, Caesar and Augustus were related before this happened, but Augustus is not Julius Caesar's son, so he sort of gets to strengthen his claim on the divine parentage by this adoption. Now, there's so much more to say about the divine parentage part of the story, but it kind of deserves its own treatment. So let me know in the comments if you guys are interested in doing like a deep dive on imperial cult, especially in the Augustan period, but like, you know, from start to finish, basically. I think that topic is super interesting. I'm always thinking about it, always talking about it. So let me know if it's something you want me to talk about on this channel. Moving on, let me read you the last little bit of book two, although again, please read the whole thing, it's so freaking good, but I'll just read you the last little paragraph here. The long night was spent, and at last I went back to rejoin my people. I was surprised by the great number of new arrivals I found. Women and men, youth gathered for exile, a wretched band of refugees, who had poured in from all over, prepared to journey across the sea to whatever lands I might lead them. The brilliant morning star was rising over Ida's ridges, ushering in the day. The Greeks held all the city gates. There was no hope of help. I yielded, and lifting up my father, sought the mountains. I literally just love this so much. Now, I, I know, I know I say that every passage that I read is my favorite. I know I just said Lucan was my favorite in the last video, but I'm telling you, I love this so much. It's, it's, just read it.
Please just read it. When Aeneas is describing the people that he's traveling with, that he's leading away from Troy, he describes them as a wretched band of refugees. Now, I'm not going to say anything about that right now, but I will come back to that later, so keep that in mind. So as Rome's earliest hero, Aeneas obviously has a lot of really good qualities and characteristics. He's good at sailing, he's good at fighting. Even though Troy lost, Aeneas goes on to lead an army in war in Italy, and he wins that war. Spoilers. He's skilled at navigation. He has all of the qualities of your regular Greco-Roman demigod. But Aeneas also has another special characteristic, and that is his piety. He's referred to as Pius Aeneas, Pius Aeneas in Latin, and throughout the story you get these glimpses of how he is pious and the things that he does for the sake of piety. Roman piety is divided into like three categories of piety, and each one of them is more important than the other. So at the top, the most important thing is to be pious towards the gods. Obviously the gods are a much higher authority than any humans, so piety towards them takes precedence over other kinds of piety. The second tier of Roman piety is piety towards your country. In English we might call it patriotism, um, and this is sort of like just devotion in a religious sense towards your country. And then the third tier is your family. It's very important to act respectfully, especially towards your ancestors and your like paternal figures in your life, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, to a degree also mothers, grandmothers, aunts, but obviously men are taking precedence here. So Roman piety exists on all three of these levels, and it's important to maintain your piety towards each of these three groups in the appropriate order. Gods first, then country, then family. Aeneas displays all of these pious qualities. We know that he is pious towards the state. We know that he's patriotic because he fights in the war against the Greeks, he does his best to make sure that as many Trojans are saved as possible, and then when it's time, he leads a number of citizens out of Troy. And we see throughout that he is pious towards his family. Back in Troy, his family were in charge, so being pious towards the state and being pious towards his family was kind of the same thing. But out on the road, he takes special care of his father, he honors his household religion by taking the household gods of Troy with him out of the ruins to make sure that their cult is maintained somewhere else. And he also takes good care of his son, who is a child at the time that all of this is happening, and is like totally dependent on Aeneas. This is his main characteristic throughout the poem, and he's constantly referred to as Pious Aeneas. It's like his official nickname, his epithet. Piety is really important in Augustus's PR campaign because he wants to portray himself as someone who is respecting tradition, so the traditional religion, uh, taking care of the people, showing piety towards the people, and also taking care of his family you know, avenging his adoptive father, Julius Caesar, by going after the assassins who murdered him. So to summarize Aeneas really quickly, he is descended from the gods. He is coming from the most famous war in mytho-history. He's involved in the most important battles of early civilization in this area. He has all of the qualities of your demigod hero that you want, especially piety. He's devoted to his people, and he is making sure that their culture is preserved. Virgil's treatment of Aeneas speaks to these sort of qualities that were important to Augustus and to the people in the Augustan period. There was so much uncertainty, so much that was not settled, so much that needed to be resolved. And as this guy who came over and changed so much about the way that 
Rome operated, he needed to reassure people that everything was going to be all right. That's my take on why Aeneas is written the way that he is. I'm drawing from a long history of scholarship on this subject that basically say kind of the same thing here, but let me know what you think about Aeneas. And in the meantime, I'll move on to our next foundation myth, the story of Romulus and Remus. After Aeneas establishes the city of Lavinium, his son Ascanius, also called Eulus, sets out to form his own city, which he calls Alba Longa. And this is where our next story takes place, the story of the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. These two were supposedly the sons of Mars and a Vestal Virgin. And after their noteworthy childhood, where they were partially raised and nursed by a wolf, a story for another day for sure, they band together to restore their father Numitor to the throne of Alba Longa. What happened was Numitor's evil brother Amulius had usurped power and he threw Numitor in prison. Once Numitor was back in power, I'm skipping most of the story here, the brothers set out to establish their own city, which would eventually be named Rome after Romulus. But the two have a disagreement, and long story short, Romulus ends up killing his brother Remus. Now, like the Aeneid, there's a lot to cover here. I'm gonna pick out a couple of stories from the life of mostly Romulus to illustrate some of the themes and values that maybe were important in the Augustan period. The main source I'm using for this, by the way, is Livy's History of Rome from the foundation of the city, Ab Urbe Condita. I don't have a specific version to recommend, but I will link an English version of it down below that you can read online. Now, the first thing I want to talk about I've already mentioned, and that is that Romulus and Remus are supposedly the sons of Mars. Like Aeneas, Rome's earliest ancestor, Rome's founders, Romulus and Remus, also have divine parentage. Not only that, but they are related to Aeneas in the first place. So they also are descended from Venus. So Rome was founded by the children of Mars and Venus indirectly. Not only does this strengthen Rome's credibility by having it be sort of divinely overseen, but specifically Mars and Venus are the gods of war and love. And this dichotomy of love and war is like a major, major feature in Roman literature. So I think that's part of the reason why it comes up here. And also to say that Romulus and Remus are qualified to found this great empire, what would become this great empire, because they have natural credibility from the gods. Jumping ahead here, Romulus and Remus are trying to get this new city founded, the city that would eventually be called Rome. And they're trying to figure out the best way to do it and who is going to be in charge. They're arguing they can't seem to come to an agreement, so they look to the gods to help them out. So they do a little bit of divination by augury, which is when you watch the way that birds fly and interpret their flight patterns and their numbers and stuff like that in order to figure out whether or not the gods are pleased with you, displeased, or what they think about any matter. So the brothers split up. They each pick one of Rome's seven hills and they stand on it looking for birds. Remus is the first to spot some avian activity. He sees six birds flying overhead. And afterwards, Romulus sees 12 birds. Each of them interprets this to mean that they are the one that should rule. Remus says, well, I saw birds first. That means that the gods have favored me. And Romulus says, yeah, you saw them first, but I saw more birds, twice as many birds. That means the gods have picked me to rule this city. A fight breaks out between them, and Romulus ends up killing Remus. An alternative to the story is that Remus was trying to mock Romulus, so he jumped over the city walls, kind of to show that the city was weak, and that's when he ended up getting killed. Now, I know these are the sons of Mars and everything, but 
it, it seems kind of strange to me to have a fratricide in the story of these guys that you're trying to glorify, but at the same time, maybe this is a reference to the civil wars that have just taken place. Yes, civil war is a necessity at times. You know, if things aren't working out, sometimes war needs to happen in order to fix the situation or improve the situation and make sure that even though war involves killing people in the short term, it will make everything better for everyone going forward. This is just a guess on my part. I'd love to know what you guys think, but I just find it unusual that this story would be included. Jumping forward again, long after Remus has died, Romulus has been working hard to set up the new city, which he calls Rome after himself, and he's trying to figure out who is going to live there. He solves this in two ways. First, in order to get sufficient guys together to be able to do the work that Rome needs, he sets up a sanctuary near the city, or in the city, I'm not really sure, so sanctuaries in antiquity were places where people could take refuge and be sort of immune from harm. So if you're a criminal and you're escaping whatever the justice system looks like in your community, you can go to a sanctuary. Even if the people chasing you find you, they can't hurt you because you are invoking sanctuary. Criminals, runaway slaves, all sorts of different people could take advantage of a sanctuary. If you'll remember from the passage that I read you in Aeneid Book 2, Aeneas takes with him a wretched band of refugees to start his new city, and he says that they came from all over. Now Romulus is setting up a sanctuary where runaway slaves and criminals can come, get citizenship, start a new life in a new settlement. In this way, Rome is portrayed kind of like this melting pot where people from all backgrounds, even checkered backgrounds, can come and, and live and prosper. This is something that we have in America as well, this idea of the melting pot, the American dream, all of that stuff. This sentiment was present in Rome as well. Rome was culturally diverse. Yes, there were culture wars. Yes, there were issues. There was obviously, you know, nothing is perfect. But in theory, at least, Rome and the wider state of Rome by Augustus's time was a place where you could move around, you could settle somewhere else, especially once more territory gets incorporated into the empire. Romans spoke many languages, practiced different religions, worshipped different gods, or the same gods by different names. All these aspects of culture were a blend of native Roman, whatever native Roman means, and all of the different peoples that they incorporated into their empire. Now, of course, behind all of this is Roman imperialism, but that's not the subject of this video. The point is the message that this story is sending. Now, I said that Romulus was trying to populate the city in two ways. The first was making the sanctuary for criminals and refugees to come and take shelter, and the second is a little more sinister. For some reason, the only people who take advantage of the sanctuary opportunity here in central Italy are men. That's fine, for now, but Romulus is thinking long term. You can't have a civilization that survives for multiple generations if there are no women. Women are a necessary part of procreation. Therefore, we need some women in our newly founded Rome. And where are we going to get them? So Romulus first tries diplomacy. He goes to the neighboring cities and asks for the right of intermarriage with their women. And everybody says no. So Romulus says, fine, if you're not going to let us marry your women, we are just going to take matters into our own hands. So he organizes this fake festival. He invites all of the neighboring cities to attend with their wives and daughters and sisters and cousins. And once everybody's there, on Romulus's signal, the men of Rome spring into action steal the women from, like, the stands where they're all sitting, and carry them back to their houses as their wives. Now, despite being literally kidnapped, 
the women actually, over time, grow to love their husbands, who are trying to make the lives of the women as easy as they can, even though they are captive prisoners. Now, once the Roman men have their new wives, they actually do try to make their lives easier. Now, I'm not trying to justify this kidnapping in any way, but, you know, they, they make an effort to say, you know, we did this because we really needed procreation and you can help with that, but while you're here, like, you know, I want you to make this your home, I want you to, you know, think of me as your partner, I'm gonna take care of you, I'm gonna do all that stuff. Doesn't sound like enough to me, but the women generally, over time, grow to love their husbands and respect them and they have children and it seems to be going well. Except what about their fathers? their brothers, their cousins, their uncles. The families of the women that were stolen gathered together to create a coalition of cities to attack Rome and get the women back. So a war breaks out between Rome and everybody else. The fighting is pretty fierce and intense and it's taking place in the streets of Rome. The women are witnessing the whole thing and they're watching their fathers kill their husbands, their husbands kill their brothers, and they're just horrified by the whole situation. So in an act of desperation and bravery, the women run into the middle of the battlefield and spread their arms out and say, stop, stop fighting. You're fighting over us. We can't bear to see all of the people that we love killing each other. We need to put an end to this. The men agree to stop fighting, and then through diplomacy they work out an arrangement where the Romans still get to keep the women for the purposes of building up their population, but their families have, you know, free access to visit them, and they will all kind of like share leadership and responsibility, and it all works out in the end. There's a million more things that we can say about this story, but I have one more tale from the life of Romulus before we move on to our last foundation myth. The biography of Romulus that Livy gives us ends in the following way. Rome has meanwhile had many more wars and has established itself as a military power in the area, so Romulus is out surveying his troops, when suddenly a really thick dark cloud descends and envelops him completely hiding him from sight from all of the people that were there to witness, the troops, the senators, everybody. And when the cloud dissipates, Romulus is nowhere to be seen. The witnesses to the event are trying to figure out what has happened. They're looking around, they can't find him anywhere. They realize that what has happened is that Romulus has been raptured up to the realm of the gods. He's no longer here on earth, he didn't die, necessarily, but he's gone and he's never coming back. From there, the senators establish the cult of Romulus, who they give a new divine name to, the name Quirinus, and create the cult worship that is still active in Augustus's time. Presumably, Romulus has been deified. He has undergone a process of transformation whereby he is now divine. Now, this is not a common occurrence in Roman storytelling. People don't just get raptured up to heaven all the time. But the message here is that exceptional leaders may be deified. In Augustus's time, part of his PR campaign is to say that his adopted father, Julius Caesar, became a god. This is a major feature of the propaganda campaign because that means that Augustus himself has divine parentage. So it's very important to show times in history when this has happened before. There's also an alternative version to this story which Livy also reports, and that is that the senators just killed Romulus because they didn't like him, and then they said that he became a god to kind of cover their own butts. Meanwhile, we have one more story from Rome's early mytho history that I wanted to cover today. The last foundation myth I want to discuss is the story of Lucretia. This is a story about how bad things happen to good people. It goes like this. 
Lucretia is the ideal Roman matron. She is in the house where she is expected to stay, especially at night, and she's doing the chores of the household. Roman women are expected to be domestic in this way, and a sign of a good woman is that she's sitting at home weaving or sitting by the fire doing something inside the house. Lucretia is highly praised for what she does in the domestic space, especially for making clothes for the family. Women who engaged in these activities were treated with the utmost respect and regarded in the most favorable light. Lucretia's husband, Collatinus, is in the army. And right now, the men are besieging Ardea, which is a city nearby. And one night, they're sitting around camp, drinking and praising their wives. Collatinus gets really invested in this conversation because he has nothing but good things to say about Lucretia. And he actually wants to prove to his army buddies how good his wife is by bringing them all over to his house, which again is kind of nearby, to sneak up on her. After all, if she were a bad housewife, she'd have another man over there. But he knows that she doesn't. So the boys take a field trip and they go to visit everyone's wives. And everyone else's wives are up to some kind of shenanigans or something and none of them really stand up to the praise that they were given by their husbands. But then they go visit Lucretia, and she is the only one that is not found partying or with another guy or something. The men approach the door, she invites them in, and that's when the son of the king, Sextus Tarquin, sees her. And in that moment, he decides that he has to have her, both because of her beauty and because of her chastity, he sees this as a conquest. The men leave for the night, but unbeknownst to Collatinus, Sextus Tarquin returns a few days later to try and put pressure on Lucretia to sleep with him. He forces his way in, and he holds her at knife point, states his case, and despite the threat of physical violence, Lucretia will not submit to him. But when Sextus Tarquin threatens to dishonor her, by killing her and killing a servant and telling everyone that he caught them in the act of adultery, she does submit. Unfortunately, a few days after the event, Lucretia can't live with the trauma of what happened to her and the dishonor that she feels that she is sort of stained with now. So tragically, she takes her own life. But before she does, she tells her husband, her father, and some of their friends what happened and why she's ending her life. She says that even though she didn't do anything wrong, she's still paying the psychological price of what happened to her, and she can't live with it. She feels disgraced, dishonored, traumatized, and she can't live with it anymore. But she makes her father and Collatinus and their friends promise to punish Sextus Tarquin for his actions. And after she says that, she ends her life. Collatinus and the rest of the men find this so unacceptable that they rally behind the oath that they swore to Lucretia, and they decide not only to expel Sextus Tarquin, the prince, but they expel the entire royal family. And in place of a monarchy, they set up the Roman Republic. They say that this is not an isolated incident. That Sextus Tarquin only felt empowered to do what he did because he's part of the royal family. And he thought that he could do it with impunity. This is an unacceptable situation. On top of the regular corruption and violence that has already been escalating under the monarchy, now we have this the greatest dishonor and horrible act. So the Romans aren't going to stand for it anymore. They're going to create a system, at least in theory, where this kind of abuse of power does not happen. There's also one plot point that I didn't mention, and that is the term rex, which in Latin means king, 
is the term that was used for the monarchs of this early Roman period. But after Lucretia's husband and his friends overthrow the monarchy, the term rex becomes a political insult, and it remains a political insult for centuries after. All of the stories I've told today have been from one specific time period. In fact, I only covered two authors, both of whom were in Augustus's inner circles. But this was a time when Rome really was looking back to its earliest origins. After so many decades of war, violence, neighbor turning against neighbor, changing values, and expanding world, the Romans are really trying to figure out, who are we? What do we stand for? What do we believe? What kind of state is this? And I think the stories that I shared with you today start to answer some of those questions. The stories we tell about ourselves say as much about who we are today as they do about who we thought we were hundreds or thousands of years ago. Someday, our descendants will look back and tell our stories, and we may not even recognize ourselves in the characters. If you have any family or community lore that you want to share, drop the stories in the comments. I cannot wait to read them. I know you guys are going to deliver. You always deliver in the comments. Thank you so much for that. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I really had fun making this one. This is one of my favorite topics in Roman history. So if you liked it and you want to let me know, you can leave me a thumbs up. And if you want to hear more about Greco-Roman belief, religion, philosophy, magic, all that good stuff, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'm posting stuff like this all the time. Thank you again for watching. I truly, truly appreciate you, and I'll see you in the next video.